clam pull out. Hey, I see, I see one right here. Okay, hey, wait. Hey, wait. Good, good lid, man. Good lid. Let's go. Hey, what do you think about all this, uh, this marijuana and stuff that's going <laughs> wild around here, Arlie? I don't know. You don't think anything about it at all? There's a lot of it in. Yeah. <laughs> Never smoke any? Nope. You just like drinking, huh? Mm-hmm. Is it around where you're from, too, down in the Ozarks? I guess. It's everywhere, ain't it? Uh, ma'am, I'd like to talk to someone uh, about seeing about getting some marijuana eradicated. All right, thank you. Four D to on the spray it does a pretty good job on it, but then they can't get to a lot of the places, and well, some people don't spray, and a lot of it you have to spray the airplane, and that's too expensive. This hemp's getting to be quite a problem around here, but, and there's been people comes in here and gets this hemp, and of course haul it off, and I guess make stuff smoke out of it. But when I was a boy, why they didn't even what it was; they made rope out of it. But now it's, they call it marijuana. Marijuana, hemp pot, weed, or grass, whatever it's called, thousands of acres of it are still growing wild in the Midwest. A tall, hardy, fibrous weed that was once grown commercially for rope, it can now be seen clustered near barns, farmhouses, and fences all through the heart of America. Where it used to be carefully cultivated and cross-pollinated, it is now ignored. Along roads, riverbanks, cornfields, drainage ditches, and especially next to the railroad tracks, where the first seeds were shaken from the train loads of hemp that were bound for the rope factories many years ago. These small patches of a tenth of an acre or less grow together until they become giant fields of wild marijuana. I'll never forget the first time that uh, I saw my first marijuana field out here. I was going down this little farm road. Suddenly, uh, what I thought was marijuana, I mean, I wasn't sure, but uh, I knew it was supposed to be around here, but uh, I started seeing these plants. And uh, then I looked over to the left in this little valley, and, and the whole valley was marijuana. I couldn't believe it. 
I mean, uh, you can go one, in one direction and you can go for 200 miles and never see a plant. But if you go to the right area, it's everywhere. Like for instance, in this area here, this is about five miles by five miles. Every single road, it's growing along every, every fence row, every, along all the roads, it's out in big patches. There's, there's fields out there, or two and three football fields in size. Uh, I don't know, there's no way of estimating, but I'd say that uh, maybe uh, there's at least 50,000 pounds out in this area right out here. Well, us farmers haven't got time enough to take care of this weed, and uh, we, we've got all we can do without fooling with it. And We do cut what's easy to get to, but that's, we can't go out every place and get it. It's too much work and too much expense. So uh, what I figured, if the government would, would come in and do a little more at it, why, they'd, uh, they could do, they got a lot of guys that really needs to work. If they could put them to work or spraying it, then they could even hire the planes to, to help us farmers out a little. And the, the county agent puts out these pamphlets. If they, if they help some, to help us to what to spray with. Cutting it don't do much good. Let's, it'll come again next year if you don't cut it early. I guess someday they'll get most of it, but it's the weed, and there'll always be weeds. So I expect there'll always be some hemp. We're the locals here. McCullough says the Call Valley Hemp Pickers Association. We pride ourselves in the fact that we know when, how, and where to pick marijuana. We know that fields are cool to go into. We know ones that aren't. Certain farmers uh, don't really pay any attention. They don't know anything about marijuana. Others will kill you if they find you on their land. A lot of the guys come in here, and, uh, well, they caught three down here in Atherton Bottom here about a month ago, and they, they, was at, they were after it then. And they, I don't know what they did with them. They, they caught them and hauled them off, and they had some cut. But they, recently, they have, I haven't seen anyone around after it because they've got it pretty well thinned out around along the roads, and a lot of the guys don't know where it's at. Uh, the only people who ever get busted here are outsiders. Uh, they come in to make a little extra money, and they just don't know how to go about it. These outsiders are brought here with these maps. Uh, they can pick them up at college campuses of the United States, and uh, these maps are actually a bust because uh, they make the fields hot. We can't get near these fields anymore. These people come here and uh, just ruin it for us and ruin it for other people that can kind of keep it cool, you know. So we have to keep finding new fields all the time. Like, if these people didn't come here uh, with these maps or they weren't put out, everything remain cool. I'm a picker. How many days uh, would you say you pick grass? Oh, one time we did it for about two, two and a half weeks, something like that, and then I've done it off and on a couple nights here, a couple nights there, probably... I don't know, around 35 nights, something like that. 35 long nights. It's scary to go into the field? For sure it's scary, man. There's a lot, all kinds of things involved, such as, uh, like, uh, farmers in the fields, like, they don't like you in their fields, and that's where you are, you're in their fields when you're picking weed. You're always in somebody's land. And uh, you can, a ditch you might fall into, snakes. Uh, there's always the narcs, too, you know. They watch out for you with helicopters and stuff like that. Or else they might be waiting for you in a field if they check it out and, you know, have a scan on everything. How long are you usually in the field picking? Usually uh, two and a half, three, three and a half hours. And what, what are you doing that whole time? Picking. That's well, all, just picking. How, how much do you come out with? Oh, uh, like, like in two, or two, two hours, you can usually get somewhere around uh, 15 to 20 pounds. Oh, that's clean, yeah. We strip, we strip them. On top. You, you clean it right there? Yeah. How do you go about doing that? We just strip them from the, from the, from the, from the, from the stems, just like that, you know? You just like this, from the stems. And put it in the sack. <laughs> There's a lot of things involved, you know? Like, you've got to go in the daylight and see exactly what is around the area that you want to pick and uh, find out if like how many dogs, they, whatever the dogs they have, if they're running loose, mean dogs, uh, how close they are, just a lot of things, where the fences are, where may holes may be, wells, empty wells, random wells, and you just got to check it out really good, you know. We even get into like uh, synchronizing our watches and uh, when we go by, most of the time when we go by, we don't even stop and we don't even open up the door because the, 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 see the light of the interior light, we jump out fast, really fast. Jump out, jump to the, jump to the, uh, to the fields, pick it, and they come back when they're supposed to pick it up. You just jump in the car again and take off, fast. Uh, has there been any time recently when you really, when you've really felt hassled when you've been working out in the field? Uh. I mean, like yesterday. Well, sometimes, sometimes you might blow, you know, 
you get kind of paranoid about certain things where it's just a normal happening. You would think it's all pointed and directed towards you, you know, such as a plane going overhead or a car slowing down by you. Or one time there's uh, these hunting dogs coming towards us, and you just don't know they're going to come right by you. And the car drops us off, you know, and we're there. The only way we got to get to anywhere is by our feet, and usually that's nowhere any close around. And we were just picking, just picking away really good, and someone kind of whispered kind of loud, there's a farmer, and there comes this farmer down this, along this road where this uh, corn was, you know, and he jumps out with his big iron, you know, and that was kind of spooky for sure. Did he see us? No, he didn't see us. But he, he must have seen somebody, I guess, but, like, he didn't see us after we got in the field because, uh, you know, he didn't uh, know where we was at. Did you leave right away? We left right away, and we never going back. Because it's too spooky, that's why we'll get caught next time. Turning to local news, Jackson County sheriffs arrested three youths last night, charging them with harvesting marijuana. After receiving a tip from a local landowner in the vicinity of Lake City Arsenal, the sheriffs moved in and surrounded the busy youths. Two of the youths were from California and one from New York. This has been the seventh arrest this week, and the Sheriff's Department expects many more as the summer months end. The Sheriff's Department is making a special appeal to all landowners in rural areas to be on the lookout for any unusual activities in their fields, especially at night. What happened if you smoke this stuff? You really? probably cough a lot. I don't know. You have to find out, man. It, every field's different. Some of it's really good and some of it's not. Just have to wait and find out. Cleaning marijuana is probably uh, the hardest job. It's a lot harder than uh, even picking it. You know, all those years of mom saying weed the garden, it's only picking up. Well, some big leaves on it. The fiber, you know, so bad, you just can't believe it. It just has to be, it has to be dried before it's transported. If you've got a lot of it, like say 100 pounds or 500 pounds of it or whatever, you can't dry it in uh, a laundromat, you can't huh? dry it in an attic, you gotta have a, a house, something like that, and it's gonna take up all the rooms of the house. So uh, that's a problem. The best way uh, to get the most resin is to hang the plant upside down. Uh, in, in this case, we knew someone around here, and so we went out and we hung the uh, marijuana out in, in another cornfield five miles away from the field where it was thick. We're, gonna, we're letting them dry for about two days, lose probably uh, half the moisture, and then we're going to dry it uh, somewhere else where it's safer. Yeah, we got a thing here against folks. <laughs> it sure is fragrant. Yeah. <laughs> you can't believe it. <laughs> Sometimes your eyelids swell. Oh, really? Yeah, when it's really dry, you know, and you have a big pile of it, like, a, like about 100 pounds of it. It's really fragrant. Give me another stock. Yeah, but this stuff's fresh. When it, when it, when it gets uh, a lot drier, it's uh, a lot worse. Marijuana!
marijuana comes in uh, all kinds of different strengths. This Midwestern grass is probably one of the weakest types you can find anywhere in the world. So because of this, many people have come up with uh, lots of different ways to try and improve this grass. The dry ice process is probably uh, the most popular. What you do is you uh, take the weed and uh, you put it in a bag and you break the dry ice up and evenly mix the dry ice and the grass all up. Then you close the bag up and you just leave a little hole at the top of the bag so the gas can escape. And then you uh, put the bag in a, in a cold either an ice box or if it's too big you put ice over the top of it so that uh, the bag stays cold and dry ice doesn't uh, evaporate too fast. Then you wait 24 hours. Supposedly that's supposed to cause a chemical reaction which will strengthen the grass. Other people have tried rotting the grass, putting it in bags and putting it in the ground for say two or three months and letting it rot. Then uh, another way, which makes sense, is uh, concentrating the grass. The idea of that is uh, to soak it in uh, various solvents, get the uh, resins out of the grass, and then put them back on other grass. This is a good idea if you're dealing with something that has some uh, strength in the first place, but uh, you can't concentrate uh, something from nothing, and there's really no, no drug qualities in this Midwestern grass. So we went out to the Midwest and uh, we saw all these people taking all these chances. Uh, risking getting shot by farmers, risking quicksand, risking snakes, risking going across the country, across state lines with weed. We saw all these people using all this energy up, uh, trying to get this Kansas weed, trying, trying to get something out of it, make it into something. We saw these people trying to improve it, trying the dry ice technique, condensing it. And we tried it, everything, all this work they put into it. It uh, was concentrated. Uh, went from 100 pounds down to 20 pounds, five to one. Should have been five times stronger. Nothing. It was kiloed to make it look like Mexican bricks. No good. Our conclusions are that uh, all this grass is good for is maybe making rope or uh, maybe making bonfires. Go up here. <laughs> I wouldn't put too much more on there. I think I'm going to have a pretty charboiled marshmallow. Stand back, everybody. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, Brandy? <laughs> 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 okay, go ahead. Oh, that's Stony marshmallow. It's going to be so sure about it. Suddenly, you know. Oh, wow. Heavy <laughs> duty. Gosh, can you imagine he's boiled in oil? <laughs> hey, don't be another marshmallow. Agricultural crops must be done in remote locations far from the eyes of curious onlookers. It hasn't always been that way, though. In fact, once, cannabis sativa was a major commercial crop. The Puritans began the cultivation of hemp in Massachusetts and Connecticut shortly after their arrival in America. Hemp homespuns were used for clothing, and hemp sails and rigging helped power the clipper ships. By the late 1700s, hemp growing had spread to over a dozen states. And in 1859, over 150 million pounds... ...is the county seat of Clark County. Now, the area that they grew the majority of hemp in Kentucky, in the period that, my knowledge, uh, uh, covers, is in Clark County, Bourbon County, Fayette County, <coughs> Mercer and Woodford County, and those counties to the north and kind of west of Clark County. Actually... 
my experience was with him was as a kid. I was born over here in Bourbon County, at Clintonville, which is just about a mile from the Clark County line. This is prior to World War I. I was just young at that time, seven and eight years old. But my father and uh, my uncle and my grandfather uh, rented about 750 acres of land, owned about 350, and each year they'd raise 100 acres of hemp. Uh, that hemp, of course, was used for rope and the various things that the hemp products are used for. In those days, when you rented land, you had to farm it. You had to get the money out of it. And hemp was a very productive, lucrative thing to raise at that time. Uh, what you did is you got the seed. You sowed the seed with just a regular grain drill, just like you in the West would uh, uh, drill wheat. Then it grew, and the uh, latter part of July, the 1st of August to the middle of August, you cut it. And you had to have a special machine to cut it. Because when this hemp was cut, it had to be spread on the ground. I never can forget it. My job was to ride the horses or the mules that were pulling these uh, hemp machines, the cutters. This hemp, of course, was cut, spread out. Then it was allowed to rot. Then they picked it up, put it in these shocks, and then broke it out. It was broke out by hand. Now, this is where the really backbreaking, uh, hard manual labor came in, and it was hand labor. It had to be done by hand labor. Certainly, I imagine you all have seen the brakes, the hemp brakes of which they broke the hemp with. They weighed about 100 pounds apiece and were made out of hickory and had these two jaws that come over the three jaws on the bottom that the hemp breakers, who were mainly colored people, I reckon you can call them that, uh, usually were the best hemp breakers. The hand brakes were just manual labor, and it took a good man to to break them. They had an art all their own, and with any of that type of labor, there is an art to doing it. And they'd pick up a handful of it, and they'd start it into this brake, and they had to manually raise this brake up and break it. And as this fiber came off, they'd wind the fiber around their arm. They were paid, not by the day's work normally, but by the amount of pounds of fiber that they had after each day's work. Well, these boys were making three dollars or two and a half, three dollars a day, depending on how good they were and how hard they wanted to work. Uh, one of my jobs in uh, around 1919, 1920, in that year, the first year that I had knowledge of, was to burn the herds after the breakers broke the shock of hemp and got the fiber out of it and they'd leave a little pile of uh, what we call hemp herds at each shock. Of course, in those days, we didn't have sense enough to scatter them back on the land and let them rot for fertilizer. No, we just burn them up, you know. And it was a pretty thing to see uh, all those fires in the twilight from maybe... 15 or 20 men breaking hemp who had broken five to seven shocks a day and then all of that burning. Of course, you'd get the smoke off of those fires as you went around to burn it. And a lot of times I'd come in the house and didn't know what was the matter with me on the pony and I'd feel like I was walking that high off the ground. <laughs> and of course, it was from smelling what you now call marijuana. We didn't pay attention to it. We didn't know anything about it. Uh, of marijuana and that kind of stuff, we called it hemp. However, the hemp breakers, they knew that if they rolled a little bit of that seed part and, and the, the real fine leaves in the top up in a bull durham cigarette, it made them happy and helped them work, so they did a little of that too then. But uh, we had to wait 40 years to find out that they were smoking marijuana, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, there is no more hemp grown commercially in uh, all of this uh, central Kentucky area. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no hemp grown or uh, for any profit in Clark County. Uh, there is a little wild hemp, and it's the seed from that old uh, production still 
coming up, and it'll germinate forever, I reckon, it's see. And uh, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank you. Most of the people that raise marijuana grow 15 or 20 plants, but some people grow much more. Hell, I can sell all that moonshine and get to St. Louis twenty dollars a young. You know, they'd say it down stuff you buy, five or six years old. I bet it's not a month old, but you got Age it in a month. All you do is bake that white oak and get some hickory bark. It's on the inside of the hickory bark. Put it in there and God damn, you've got some good drinking in. A lot of damn work. you got to keep that fire going and watch it. Keep it the right temperature and everything, you know. Keep that cooler just right or otherwise your damn whiskey no good. I love the taste of it, you know. It's not really the buzz as so much. As I just like to drink and be sociable and that damn... Grass in my lungs not too damn good, I don't think, and it makes me cough. But I get a good high out of it. <laughs> Growing grass a little easier, you know. How long have you been growing these plants around here? Oh, about this next two years. It's pretty good land out right here. Big field. A little over two acres here, you know. Yeah. I grow my grass from the best seed. Acapulco gold or Panama red, whatever I can get. I get the saw real loose and plant the seed about half an inch. Oh, you can put it in a bed and plant a whole bunch like tomato plants. Transplanted, but it's pretty damn hard to get them to live. But first, when you start, when you transplant it, you know, sickly little dude there for quite a while. Then all of a sudden, that zombie spring up there and start growing. It's really beautiful. How long is the last you plant do you usually harvest it? Oh, hell, I don't know. Four or five months. After four or five months, then what do you do with it? You just dry it up, key it up. Okay, key it, what, what do you mean, key it up? Well, you know, when you when they sell it, you can sell it in a, in a key. It's called a key. Then they put it in little plastic deals called a lid. They take a key and make several mm-hmm. lids, you know, and it's easier to ship if you're going to ship it out. It, it's just a matter of shipping then. Yeah. How many kilos do you figure that you'll be making in a year? God damn, I don't know. <laughs> Got any idea? No. No idea. You right. never, never know, you know. You know, everybody that uses the damn weed, they can grow it and cheaper, you know. Just like making whiskey, they can sell enough to keep it going. I get a kick out of seeing how it grows up there pretty and green, you know. I like to brag on them high ones, too. <laughs> these mostly Mexican seeds? Or? Yeah. Up, where'd you get them started? Up the house? Yeah. Stock. Look at the damn males here. They were a few like that last year. I got them two to four ounces for my five foot plants last year. This year my plants are averaging eight to nine feet. I get about a quarter of a pound from each of these plants. I cut my grass, hang it upside down in the shade, let it stay for about three weeks until it gets brown and turns dry. And I cut the tops off, 
strip the leaves off and then strip the leaves off the stem. Use a three ton jack to press my grass with. Not really kilos, they're one pound blocks. But you gotta be completely dry when you press it, otherwise it'll rot. It takes about five minutes to press a kilo or a block, one pound block. The grass you gotta be pressed quite tight or it'd spring loose when the jack is released. By pressing the grass on a it takes about one fourth the space that otherwise would require. You have a lot of friends that come over. I guess most of your friends are drinkers, there, right? Yeah. And I have a lot of friends on my grass, too. Do any of them mix at all, or are they pretty much separate? Very damn few. I've noticed that, too, by the way. You know, a guy on grass, he went hard to drink. And a lot of them guys don't even smoke cigarettes or a pipe or anything. They smoke that damn grass. You think they're going to keep growing weed around here? Oh, I think maybe a year or two. Mostly for yourself or? Yeah, for your... just friends and self. Acapulco Gold Ain't 
in Acapulco because you have the best view, the best view, the honor. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. One of the guys work here. Your name? Gilberto. Gilberto. I'm going to introduce you one of the best guys in Acapulco. His name is Emere Cumbe. Hey, I'm so happy to be here in Acapulco and I mind everybody and enjoy. And if you want to be happy, come to Acapulco. And then I'm going to introduce you. Come on. Come on. I want to introduce you one of the best guys here in Acapulco. This is a, the pirate. Oh, see, what do you want to talk about? Talk about everything you wanted. Habla en español, que chinguen a su madre los gringos. Gabino Barrera. Gabino Barrera. Gabino Barrera and, and Emiliano Zapata. Look the eyes.
When you buy grass in Mexico, uh, the most important thing is your contact, who you buy it from. For instance, in Acapulco, you wouldn't want to buy downtown or, say, from the Beach Boys on the beach because uh, there's a good chance that they might be working for the federales. And then uh, what you'd be doing is buying right from the police. If they're not uh, federales or working for the federales, they might be uh, outright crooks and just uh, steal all your money, and that'd be it. You'd be out of, out of everything you had. So uh, your best chance is you, you've got to, you've got to go out of town and uh, you go out to the farmlands or, or go out in the mountains where uh, people are more serious about their grass stealing. After looking uh, all over Acapulco, we finally found our friend, and uh, he was really hard to find. He didn't want to talk uh, about any uh, grass fields on the beach, because he said that uh, it was really hot around there, and the federales had uh, really been all over busting everyone, so it was really hot. So uh, he said to come to his house tomorrow in the jungle, and we'd talk about it there. How much is uh, one kilo of Acapulco going? One kilo in Acapulco? Yeah. Well, uh, pay, you pay for one kilo in Acapulco is for 600 pesos. 600 Maybe, pesos? Yeah. 48 dollars. Yeah. For uh, 10 kilos. 10 kilos is maybe so it's maybe 500 pesos 500 or 600 pesos. Okay, okay that's 40 dollars, uh, 100 kilos. 100 kilos in the 450 pesos for one kilo and this for for, for 100, 100 kilos. That's 36 dollars. Yeah. Uh, a thousand kilos, real kilo. Yeah. Oh. Ten. How much? This in the maybe for 350 pesos, maybe in the thousand kilo. 350 pesos. Yeah. 30, 30 dollars. Yeah, 30 dollars. Yeah. How much for dollars for one kilo in San Francisco? Uh, four hundred dollars. Oh, too much dollar hey, for one kilo. It's in Forty dollars here. Yeah, <laughs> it's too much different. A lot of money. Yeah, too much money in Mexico for San Francisco for one kilo. Forty dollars in Mexico for. <laughs> Too much dollar in, for one kilo in San Francisco. You pay? A lot of money. A lot of money, yeah. How long would it take for 100 kilos? How long here to get here? It's too much time. How, how, how many days? It's for three days. It's you. Three days? Yeah. You, two, two days. Two days? Two, yeah. For sure? Yeah. We want 100, 100 kilos. kilos. Hmm? For 100 kilos. Yeah. yeah. Is it safe? There, yeah. yeah. No problem? No, 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 like, no, like a problem. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Are they pressed? Pressed kilos? Yeah, it's packet, yeah. Oh, packet? No packet, yeah. Not pressed? They're no. Not pressed, no. It's packet. Packet? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um, so we can have 100 kilos in two days? Mm-hmm. Okay, then... Okay, I think we'll, we'll do that. Yeah, right. For this, my friends is in Papanoa. 
is it three three thousand kilo kilos? Yes, yes, three thousand kilos. Yeah, the grass, yeah, in the Papua Noa. Papua Noa? Yeah. Where is it? In the down in the mount, down in the beach or where? No, no, he's in the house. In my friend, he's in the montaña. Is it a family or a lot of different no, people? No, no, no family. No, it's I two people, two men. Two men? Yeah. How old? In the twenty one. Um, 21 old for one, he 30 old for my friend in Club de Tari de Gras. 30. 30, 30 years old yeah. and 21. Yeah. Are there any banditos? Huh? Are there yeah. any banditos up there? Yeah. How do you get up there? With the car? No, no car. He's in the car, he's in the population. Big population. Wait. Ride a horse or walk? Yeah, horse, yeah, horse. Yeah, horse. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's in the pocket and the two, uh, two big pockets uh, for one horse. Two big pockets, yeah. How many horses? Is it, how many horses? Five horses. Yeah. Five horses? Yeah, proprietary, my friend. The best thing is for us to go down there, get it down there, our shots, but be not involved in, in driving it up there. Can, can we go down there with you? Hmm? Can we go there with you? I see I is for one of my friends. It's two people. I my friends is in the car. What about us? Him, me, you, and your friend? This is not like it for police, it's in the maybe it's in the American people. What if we, we hide, get down, get down, go. He, he's in the yeah. yeah, it's for good but it's I not like my friends for he's in the in the car. But we we have to go now. Tomorrow. Ventura finally agreed to go with us to Papa Noah. 140 miles outside of Acapulco, out in the boondocks. There we would meet his friend, who we hoped would take us by horseback to his fields in the mountains behind Papa Noah. Good weed, super weed, Acapulco gold. They don't really grow any uh, Acapulco gold in Acapulco. It's all grown in the hills outside of Acapulco. And this place, Papa Noah, is one of the main centers for it. This place sits right down on the seashore at the foot of the mountains, and it's all grown all up in the mountains behind this town.
When we were up in the fields, we decided not to take delivery because uh, it was just too dangerous. Yeah, sure, the price was better. $6 up there compared to $30 at Venturas in Acapulco. But, uh, like, it was, it's just too dangerous, you know? There's uh, a lot of federal rallies all around in the mountains, but uh, you don't know where they're at. I mean, you know, they might be 50 miles from here, and they might be right up in those hills right there. Uh, the main thing about them is that they uh, pack uh, 45 pistols, and uh, <laughs> they use them. That's the whole thing, you know. They'll shoot you. They'll shoot you just for weed. I mean, uh, it's just not worth the risk. I just couldn't see uh, taking a pack train 30 miles through Bandito territory just, just to save a few dollars. I'd rather get back to the United States where Acapulco Gold sells for 300 a pound. So the deal we made with them was that they would uh, deliver the Acapulco Gold to Venturas outside of Acapulco in two days.
Hey, how's it going? Yeah, what's been going on? Yeah, well, I had a, I had a really out of sight trip, man. It was really successful. You now, uh, the fishing was out, was just outstanding. I caught a 220-pound sailfish. So, uh, anyway, we're gonna have a party down here tomorrow. Why don't you come on down? Okay, we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, here they come, Bob. seems safe. Okay, well, you see over there, it's all Tijuana on the top of the hill there, and you see the, the bull ring sitting up there. Just on this side of it is the fence, and Mexico is on the other side. Now, between uh, the fence and this, this river mouth here, uh, it's pretty hot. There's a lot of border patrolmen in there, and uh, that's the uh, part we have to watch out for. There's a road uh, that goes along the fence just on the top of that hill up there by the by the bull ring, and uh, it's a border patrol road. Nobody else can drive on it. They, they drive up there, and you can usually see them because they have to have their headlights on. But uh, you got to watch out because sometimes they, they'll uh, park up there and uh, leave their lights off. They have binoculars, and they, they can see the whole beach with binoculars. Uh, uh, somebody standing on the beach will stick out like a sore thumb all the way down it, uh, especially over the horizons of the lights in the city in the background there. We will have to watch out for the Mexican police up there because they uh, patrol their side of the fence too. And they think something funny's going on. They see me going into the water with a huge big bag for some reason. And you'll be dropping me off just uh, about 7.30, just before dark. From the time I leave, it should take probably oh, about an hour and a half for me to, to uh, swim. Uh, I have the kilos tied around my waist with a uh, nylon cord and after I get out to the breakers I take it and put it out in front of me and I just hold it out in front of me like this like a kickboard and I I kick the whole way. Probably the hardest part of the whole trip is uh, getting out past those breakers uh, with all those kilos. I'll hit the water over there uh, just before uh, dark. By the time I get down to here it'll be pretty dark. I want you to be waiting for the fire going up here on this side of the, the river mouth here, the sluice. How are you going to know if there are fire? What if there's two or three fires? Well, I'll know. I can see pretty well from the water. I've got uh, a mask with prescription lens lenses in it, so it doesn't hurt my sight at all. I, I can tell. If something seems funny, you uh, douse the fire and leave. That'll let me know that uh, there's something the matter. I'll swim back to Mexico. 